How do you get Republican support for this? How do you get rural support? And sometimes those are the same, but not always. Well, rural support is pretty easy because they see the impacts of climate the most, mm -hmm. I would argue. Um, and when we go out to you know, wind farms in Oregon or we talk to farmers who are trying to pay for the you know, covered irrigation ditches so that the wa their water isn't um, evaporating so quickly, they get it, they see it. If you don't, you know, it's maybe not climate change. I think it's more about words than it is about um, understanding the impacts of climate. And they've all seen their, um, a lot of counties have seen their um, communities transformed through wind energy and through wind energy dollars, right? So Was Wasco County just got a K through 12, beautiful state of the art K 12 um, through wind dollars and through wind tax base. And Sherman County is the same way. And then you look at Lake County that powers their hospitals with geothermal. So that's 35%. So that's money that they would normally be spending on energy that they can now funnel into better care in their, um, in their healthcare system. When they start powering their schools, that means that that's money going back into our kids' classrooms. And so I think to just bifurcate it where this is an urban thing versus a rural thing, it's absolutely not. And our chairs have done, the chairs in the legislature have done a really good job of ensuring that our rural communities the ones that have really been hit first and worst by climate are the ones that were focused on first to make sure that they're getting the support that they need so that their economies can grow again. And so I think that, you know, it's a little bit of a misnomer because you'll see the big farm bureau come out against a bill like this, but we have 140 farmers and ranchers who've signed on to the bill. So it's, you know, whether or not you're a big association representing Monsanto and Dow, sure. But when you're actually looking at Oregon farmers, they see the need for it and they, um, they, see, the, they see the opportunities that are there. And on Republicans, this is a Republican idea. This is, was created by Ronald Reagan in the acid rain. Was he the one? And then and Duff, George, and George w. Bush implemented Sen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bush Sr. was the one because it's a market-based system. I mean, I think if you ask some of our... Uh, friends in the environmental community, they don't think this goes far enough and they would like to see just a direct cap and direct regulation on folks. Um, so Republicans now, I think because of where we're at and just the discourse of our politics, um, feel like they have to uh, oppose it. But if you actually look at their values and you look at and you listen to what they say, especially during testimony and hearings, it's it's all based on their values. I'll also say, Looks you know, like. uh, rural Oregon is not actually regulated under this program, so agricultural and forestry sectors are not regulated sectors. We're fo focused on the biggest sources of fossil fuel mm -hmm. um, in our, our power and, and transportation and industrial side. And so uh, they're actually not regulated, but the investments prioritize those areas because they are most impacted by climate change. And a lot of that, um, we've touched on some of the clean energy uh, pieces of that and how it's growing the tax base and they see a big potential out there because that's where our best solar and wind resources mm -hmm. are, are in the rural parts of our state. But it's also uh, looking at our forestry sector, they, are, they see a big opportunity to do more sustainable management of forests and that can put a lot of people to work. It can sequester more carbon and avoid forest fires. So that's been, we've had a lot of groups at the table um, who have been excited about that perspective under the, under the bill too. What do you expect to happen in the 2018 legislature? We expect to have a robust discussion. Um, we have hearings starting next week and um, we actually have quite a few tribal leaders that will be coming down to talk about their interest in, in climate change and their interest in uh, clean energy jobs. The ATNI, the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians, um, have signed, passed a resolution supporting this bill. Um, I think that, you know, we're, we're an advocacy coalition, so we're going to push and fight to um, make sure that everybody is heard on this bill and they take serious consideration the policy is baked, um, you know, I think that we're actually past our due date. So I'd say we're, this baby's at about 42 weeks. 
and we're ready. <laughs> and uh, we're hoping that we can, uh, you know, deliver through this session. It's not going to be easy, and we recognize that. But at this point, we've been working on this for 10 years. Our emissions are going up, and we want to send the signal, especially when Trump just cut 72% of the funding to clean energy. It seems like a great time for Oregon to say, we're open for business. We're planting a flag. Y'all can come over here. So what do you say to the legislator who's been told to vote against this uh, for any variety of reasons to convince him or her that it is good for that person's constituents? I think it depends on the legislator and it depends on the reasons that they've decided that it's not a good vote for them. Um, we generally point to the fact that this is working in multiple jurisdictions. Um, so California is one example, which we understand it pulls well to tear down California. So we're going to do that as much as possible. But the reason we're tearing them down is because their economy is growing under cap and trade. Their fuel prices have fallen and so have their, and their utility rates, right? So let's tear that down. But the great news is, is Quebec and Ontario also have successful programs where they're experiencing the same thing. Um, and then I would also look at the Reggie states, the nine northeastern or ten with, um, with New Jersey, and see the same things happening. So I think each of those jurisdictions, we all have similar um, kind of electoral maps within our states, right? Some are red, some are blue. Um, generally, it's kind of your urban areas are a little bit more blue, then you get further out and it's red. But they're all experiencing the same uh, windfalls of investments. In California, 55 out of 56 counties have been invested in through the cap and trade dollars, their cap and trade investment fund. Um, and those communities, so one community um, in the San Joaquin Valley, they had a, a, a community housing project that it was a low income housing um, community that applied for cap and invest funds to get solar panels on the houses. And uh, this woman, Maria, applied, they, you know, the community applied for them. They, they received the funds. The whole community got solar panels. So that was one piece of the cap and invest fund. The pro program actually trained and was part of a training program for solar installers. Her son became a solar installer through the program, helped put the solar panels on his mom's house and his neighbors. And so now he has a great family wage job. Maria's bills went from $200 to $1.50 a month, right? That's a lot. And so if I'm a legislator and I have constituents who have power bills, which we all do, and I'm sitting there saying, no, we don't want to invest in your community, we don't think it's necessary, then I think that their constituents need to take a hard look on at them and if they're making the right choices. Are we listening to out-of-state oil companies that are saying that everybody should be scared of cap and trade or carbon policies in Oregon? Or do we actually look at the history that we're now seeing year after year of increased economies, increased jobs? Oregon has 48,000 people working in the clean energy sector, right? So that's anyone from an administrative assistant to a salesperson to an installer. Those are real jobs. We need to grow those jobs. Those jobs aren't just in Portland, right? Those jobs are all over our state. So I would challenge any legislator to, to with a straight face, say that those investments wouldn't help their constituency or their district. I also think we're in a, a, a real race for competitiveness mm -hmm. to capture our share of the clean energy economy. There are a lot of businesses right now making a choice of where to invest and what states are committed to clean energy. So for example, in California, they, uh, Proterra is an electric bus manufacturer who decided to set up their manufacturing plant in California after they passed their policy because they saw the long-term commitment to clean energy. And now they're using some of those cap and trade dollars to help all their transit agencies transition to electric buses from diesel made there in California. That's a huge job producer. These companies are looking right now at Washington debating their carbon pricing policy. California has one. If Oregon doesn't, we are missing out. China has passed a cap and trade policy that starts by 2020. Mexico. So even if we pass ours, uh, we will already be beat to the punch by China getting there first. Mexico has one passed. We know the EU has had one for a long time. All of Canada is adopting a carbon pricing policy. This is really where 
the world is going. And so this transition to clean energy, we are in a real race here to capture our share of, of that economic opportunity.